So uh, the history of ASAS has a fascinating history, um, which is also related to the history of, of civilian cryptography in general. So um, uh, in the world of post-World War II, encryption was considered uh, ammunition. Um, it was considered secret. Uh, and there wasn't any thought that uh, civilians would like to use encryption, <clears throat> the digital encryption. But as uh, in, uh, information technology developed, uh, as banks started to have their clearing networks like SWIFT and so on, uh, there was an interest in having some kind of civilian encryption scheme, which uh, you could use to protect civilian secrets like health or, uh, or finances and so on. So the um, uh, US uh, Department of Trade, I think, uh, went to uh, IBM and, and told them, uh, or the, I think that they went to, yeah, they went to IBM and told them, listen, can you uh, get us kind of a nice encryption scheme we can use uh, for civilian purposes? So IBM, it's not a nice cat. No, it's a bad cat. <laughs> it's, it just broke our router yesterday. Yeah, it's a miracle I can still have this lecture. Uh, and it's not, not even good looking. Anyway, yeah, so back to the material. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, IBM went and thought and, and, and gave uh, a cipher called Lucifer. A Lucifer was an invention of IBM. It had a 64-bit key uh, and it did something. It was based on IBM knowledge and based on uh, work from, uh, from World War II and so on. Uh, and uh, the NSA, the National Security Agency in charge of, uh, of secrets, uh, told IBM, you know what, give us Lucifer, we want to look at it a little bit more. And the NSA uh, thought a couple of, uh, a period of time and, and told uh, the, uh, the Department of Trade, no, uh, this is what you should use. Instead of Lucifer, we're going to change it here, and we're going to change it there, and we're going to reduce the key size and add some things and change some tables. And this is what you're going to use, and you're going to call it the, da the data encryption standard. Now, uh, let me uh, uh, release the camera. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the code that uh, the NSA, the design that the NSA returned, the DES uh, cipher, uh, had a 56-bit key length instead of 64. It had some additional um, changes to the internal structure, and the tables that are used to substitute bytes to one another, they changed some values. Of course, it didn't tell anybody why. And now, uh, from the uh, uh, from the history, now now we're uh, we know a little more about the process. We know that the reason there the, the, the three reasons that the NSA changed Lucifer into this. Uh, one of them was to make it harder to implement it in software. They did a really silly thing which didn't help security in any way, but just made it harder to implement in software. And they reduced the key size so it would be able to be brute forced using the computing power they had in, in the 70s. So 56 bits was enough for them to be brute forced. And the third thing actually, they changed the internal structure of Lucifer in a way which made it more secure, not less secure, because the NSA knew of, an, of a cryptanalytic attack called uh, differential cryptanalysis or linear cryptanalysis. Um, they couldn't tell anybody that they knew about this technique, because even saying that they knew it would be enough for, uh, for uh, attackers to kind of reverse engineer it. Um, but uh, um, Shamir and Biham, it was uh, Eli Biham's uh, PhD, if I remember correctly, uh, differential cryptanalysis of uh, of this. Uh, and what uh, what Biham discovered is that in fact uh, the Lucifer tables were much less secure than the death tables. Uh, so uh, NSA knew about this attack and could defend, but they couldn't tell anybody that they're doing it because so there was a huge paranoia about this and um, people, so a lot of cryptographic research was 
trying to understand what is going on in death, what is going on with these tables. Um, so um, uh, the um, the Electronic Freedom Frontier, it's uh, an American nonprofit. Uh, Omer, if you have something to say, say it. Otherwise, mute. Omer. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, so they said that they think that uh, death is too weak, it can be brute force. So they built a machine called uh, Deep Crack. Deep Crack is a piece of hardware that can brute force death. So they actually built it, it cost them a half a million dollars. And uh, then uh, death became too insecure to be used. <laughs> Thank you. Is this Dimitri? Alex, okay, Alex. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm always for ruining my concentration. It's yeah. It's it's it's, it's recommended. Uh, so um, <clears throat> so uh, this simple death was too insecure, and uh, what uh, was invented then was called triple death. Triple death. You use death, but you do it three times, and as a result, it is how many times as secure. You use this three times, then it is, no, it's exactly two times, it's exactly twice as secure. And the reason is uh, some kind of um, time memory trade-off, uh, also very fascinating, also not relevant to this course. But you were, now you had a 112-bit cipher, uh, which was very inefficient. Uh, so the NSA actually built this to be inefficient in software. To keep, uh, you know, to keep it from being brute force. So there was like garbage code in there just to make it slower and harder. And uh, people still weren't any, weren't really convinced that there weren't any backdoors or tricks there. And 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 we know, by the way, uh, there is a story about uh, uh, a random number generator that the NSA uh, paid uh, paid RSA data security and Microsoft to include in their cipher suites. And everybody's convinced that there is a backdoor there. Uh, but okay, so so in the 90s there was a belief that DES is kind of uh, it's, it's it's expired. We need to get something new. So uh, they uh, the uh, the federal uh, the FIPS the, 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 NIST, the National Institute of Science and Standards and Technology said uh, we're going to have a competition to find the best uh, replacement for DES. And it had to be uh, secure, it had to be efficient, it had to be uh, uh, cheap, it had to be fast, and so on. And they had like a very open competition. Uh, they had conferences, they're very uh, completely open. And um, who won this competition? Uh, two PhD students, uh, two, sorry, two young doctors from, uh, from, uh, the, from Karl Leuven in Belgium. Uh, called uh, Vincent Reme and Johan Dahmer. And now uh, it's called Rinda after both of their last names. And now we're going to travel to uh, Belgium uh, to see a movie, a propaganda movie about uh, AES. And you know, think about it. You're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a movie producer and the university tells you, uh, make a movie about AES. So, what do you do? What do you do? So, what is really nice about this movie, I really like showing it, is that they actually went and took pictures of the implementation security lab in Kowloon, and you can also see all the devices there. So, I I like to pause this movie and show you what they're doing, how are they doing implementation attacks in Kowloon, the home of uh, AES. So, I'm going to paste it and also open it. Uh, there are subtitles in Dutch if you want. Uh, not compulsory. Aan de Leuvense Universiteit wordt op diverse vlakken een baanbrekend onderzoek verricht, wat een grote impact heeft op ons dagelijks leven. Zo is de internationale standaard voor de beveiliging van gevoelige gegevens, de Advanced Encryption Standard, AES, gebaseerd op onderzoek van de professoren Vincent Rijmeij en Johan Daan. 
een blok zijn van deze methode om de gegevens te kopiëren. En dan ga ik eens even alleen maar ontcijferd gaan worden als je het juiste paswoord kent. Gebruikt om in geheim te houden, maar ook om zeker te zijn dat dingen niet gewijzigd worden. De beveiliging is cruciaal in de strijd tegen cybercriminaliteit. De methode die de leukste onderzoekers hebben bedacht. Oké, oké. Zo, we zijn in de second 52 of the film. En we zien hier. Oh, no, 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 no. We zien hier de power analysis setup van de student in Kaluven. Uh, for bonus points, found out who, find out who this guy was. I, I don't know right now, but there is, he has something called SCD in the background. So what do we see here? Uh, on the right, we have an oscilloscope. And we'll have a, sh we'll have a, a closer shot of the oscilloscope later. Uh, and the oscilloscope is connected to the device under the test. Again, we'll, we'll have another shot of that. And the, the student is running, actually is running MATLAB. And here are some power supplies, and here is the window. So, okay, let's keep going. They, they are a good university because they let the students have a lab with windows, so they're very kind. You see a uh, Windows 7, okay, here's Windows 7, and he's using MATLAB, and he has a uh, DVD. Institute for Standards in Technology uitverkoren tot wereldwijde standaard. Oh, oké. Okay. Here is another nice shot. I'm at uh, one minute and one, uh, one minute and one second. So, this is, this looks to me like a power analysis setup because there are two uh, cables and there is something between them which is being measured. So, I'm going to guess that there is uh, a, a very small resistor here and they're doing power analysis on this resistor. And this thing looks like a filter. This could be a, a filtered power supply or something like that. Oh, okay. I'm at one uh, minute and 10 seconds. Uh, and what we see here is this something very cool. This is what is called a low noise amplifier. So uh, I'm going to guess that they're not measuring the power directly because power is uh, it's it's, uh, it's strong enough to be measured with an oscilloscope without any amplification. I'm going to guess they're doing uh, radio frequency measurements. So they have some kind of a, yeah electromagnetic or magnetic probe, and uh, the signal is very weak, so they need to amplify it. And another thing you have here in this box is a filter. Because after they amplify it, they amplify a lot of noise. So they're trying to filter away the noise using this thing. So let's keep going. Vandaag wordt AES gebruikt in meer dan 2 miljard toestellen en in tal van toepassingen. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, let's go. Smartphones and laptops for online banking, Wi-Fi verbinding, and so forth. One of the technology companies that makes use of the standard is NXP. It develops secure elements of bank chips that in bank and identity cards sit. One of the essential elements in a bank chip is the ability to be encrypted. En zo'n versleutelingsalgoritme moet natuurlijk door veel mensen vertrouwd worden. En de andere producten die gebruikt worden, ook hetzelfde algoritme. Dus vandaar dat uh, in vrijwel alle uh, secure elements die wij in de markt hebben, de Advanced Encryption Standard of de AES standaard. En hoe digitaler ons leven wordt, hoe groter ook de nood aan beveiliging. Professor Rijmen verwacht dat het gebruik van AES nog zal toenemen. Het is al ook gebruikt worden in de Communicatie, alles wat u naar kan indenken, waarbij iets verzonden wordt. Is de veiliging nodig? En de AS is een van de mijnen van het die. Oh, oké, okay. oké. Okay. I really like this shot. So, this is another shot of the implementation security lab. 
Breaking laser beams. All right. What is in this box? In this box are lasers. And and this is a, actually, this is a very nice uh, safety trick. Um, so uh, and you see the student isn't wearing uh, uh, laser protective equipment. He doesn't have glasses and uh, I don't know what. And uh, so uh, what do you do if you want to uh, use lasers for implementation security? Uh, you make this, so this box is actually the laser lab and there is a safety, a safety cache. So the laser will not turn on as soon, as long as, long as this box is in place. So now the question arises, why would I want to shine a laser at my device on the test? Uh, one answer is freaking lasers, man. Uh, the other answer is, um, as some people here might know, if you shine a laser at, um, at the right frequency at a transistor, uh, it might get so excited that it will flip its state. Yeah. So uh, you can actually modify single bits and then you can do uh, fault attacks, very interesting fault attacks. Of course, to get the laser to shine at the transistor, you need to do very dramatic things to the device under test. So the first of them is opening it. Uh, but uh, in some cases, you are uh, motivated enough to do it, and then having a laser is useful. So uh, let's watch the last couple of seconds of this video. Ratings and values. So, yeah, we have that all in the last few years, we have to be at least. Oh, here's another nice toy. This is an uh, XY table. You see this uh, thing, this gray tray? So the XY table can move the device very gently in, uh, in space. And you use it to uh, have an EM probe. You want to find the exact right place where you want to probe. You uh, use the XY table to kind of, it's called cartography. You map the device and look for the best place to do your measurement. Yeah, overall, it's all Okay. That is, ladies and gentlemen, that is Kaulovin, home of the AES encryption standard. So, um, so AES uh, won the competition. It won the competition. It's cool. Um, I'll talk about how it's designed in a little detail. But before that, um, how do I actually use 